Welcome to Kaleidoscope. I'm your host, Ofer Siegel. Today I'm honored to have with me Professor Eisenman, who is the professor of Middle Eastern Religions at California State University at Long Beach and also the director of the Institute of Judeo-Christian uh, Origins at the Cal State University at Long Beach. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Professor Eisenman is on the cutting edge of academia on the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he's the one that saw that we, the public, are able to share in the wealth and the knowledge of the Dead Sea Scroll, which is now in process. And Dr. Eisenman, we thank you for that. Oh, it was uh, it was long time coming, and it was not necessary to do, so we did it. Tell me, what is so important about these 2,000-year-old scrolls? What is significant? Where were they found, tell me? And what are the contents that are so controversial? Well, what's so important about them is they uh, give us an a, uh, eye hole, a peephole into the history and culture and uh, times of the period that so many people are interested in, the first century BC to the first century AD. And uh, the reason for all the controversy was because for 35 or 40 years, uh, they were controlled by a very tight-knit uh, group who uh, maybe had some of the best motives, but uh, in controlling the materials, uh, propagated their own theory and really weren't too interested in having a free debate or having opposition uh, theories uh, come, in, come into the picture. So when we had an academic uh, sort of curia, an oversight mm -hmm, committee, mm -hmm. not only controlling the publishing process but controlling the interpretation of the um, scrolls, you really couldn't have a proper debate in this field. That was one of the mm -hmm. reasons that we wanted to break this thing open. Professor the scrolls Eisenman, were found, go yeah. ahead. I, I wanted to ask you, who was that group that you're talking about? Who were they? What was it composed of? Who were those? Well, people? this was a group, actually. What happened was the scrolls were found in 47-48 uh, in the middle of the Arab-Israeli uh, um, imbroglio. And um, after things uh, settled out from there, uh, ultimately, as your listeners probably know, the Jordanians got control of the area that the scrolls came from. And so though some of the scrolls had come in before the Jordanians exercised this control, these were the scrolls that the Israelis finally got some and bought others in New York in the early 1950s. They went into the so-called museum or shrine of the book, which is located near the parliament building in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was the public thought that those were the Dead Sea Scrolls, that mm. that, that, that was all of the um, um, yes. sc um, scrolls. There's an exhibition touring uh, America at the moment of some of these m materials. But it turned out those were only the uh, scrolls from Cave 1, the first uh, cave discovered in 47. After a period of time from 48, 49, 50 on into the early 50s, around 55, there were 11 other caves found. And all those materials poured in in Jordanian times. And the Jordanians uh, really didn't know what to do with these Hebrew manuscripts, so they set up a so-called international committee. The committee, as it turned out, was largely dominated by Dominican monks and mm -hmm. clerics of one kind or another. And whether for uh, proper academic motives or otherwise, they developed a theory called the Essene theory. And uh, since they controlled the remaining text, they controlled the publication. They controlled what scholars had access. So in the end, they, they, uh, they controlled who the stars of this field were. Mm -hmm. Because by giving them manuscripts and so on, they could make a young scholar into an instant su superstar. Mm -hmm. So they controlled the academic chairs. They controlled the publishing processes. And that's why over the last 30, 40 years, when a go-slow policy was put into, into place, since they had a mainly clerical viewpoint, a viewpoint mainly coming from Orthodox Christian uh, standards, mm -hmm. uh, the theory we had was a theory that was convenient for that point of view. Yeah, but you're talking about very sensitive times and issues. Very you're sensitive. You're talking about, I guess, it was sort of a library that documented historical and theological events that took place Mm -hmm. during uh, the inception of founding skeletal fibers of Christianity. Yeah, well, the thing is that the uh, reigning theory tried or was in the process of pushing this material back earlier. Mm -hmm. So the materials were presented to the public as forerunners of what, of what Christianity uh, was and became. Mm -hmm. uh, the scrolls, you see, don't resemble Christianity as we know it. Mm -hmm. There's, they are permeated, chock full of concepts that are familiar in Christianity, uh, concepts like, uh, well, uh, an outright messianism, uh, Holy Spirit baptism, 
justification, justification by works, things of that kind that are very familiar. But the scrolls represent the 180 degree inversion of Christianity as we know it. So if you are a person from a clerical background or an orthodox uh, theological mindset, you would not be able to see Christianity in these documents as mm -hmm. you knew it. Mm -hmm. Well, what we were came along and said, and the reason we needed to break the academic monopoly so that we could yes. have a real debate, which is what we're getting yes. into now, the phase that we're into now is the phase of the interpretation of the um, scrolls. What we were saying is that this group is, first of all, highly messianic, messianic in the normal way. That is, they expect a son of David, they expect a, uh, a messianic leader from the tribe of um, Judah who will rule the world in power and glory and so on and so forth. So we have that normal Judeo-Christian messianism there, but the scrolls are militant, Oh, that's a very interesting point. I always <coughs> thought that uh, the founding fibers of Christianity is based upon love and peace and that sort of uh, message. Yeah, these are very noble sentiments and no one is gainsaying the beauty of uh, these kind of sentiments. But as it turns out, these sentiments really re uh, re represent and overseas what we would in the field call a Gentile Christian approach. What has happened, in, we think, in the presentation of Christianity as we know mm -hmm. it is that that overseas Hellenized, that Pax Romanum, that Christianity that was developed in the interest of the Pax Romanum, mm -hmm. Paul says in his letters, you must pay your taxes, uh, that the Roman uh, authorities were placed here by God, and so on and so forth. That peacefulness, turning the other cheek, mm -hmm. uh, uh, loving your enemies, and so on, which is a very Hellenized approach, though beautiful, really is not reflected in the Palestinian documents of this period. Now, the scrolls are just the opposite. The scrolls don't teach, and I'm not advocating one or the other, I'm just stating a fact mm -hmm. historically. The scrolls don't teach turning the other, other uh, cheek. cheek. The scrolls yeah. don't ter teach loving your enemies. As beautiful as those concepts might uh, be, the scrolls uh, teach hate the sons of the pit. That's what I mean. The scrolls are totally militant, uncompromising, unbending, a kind of xenophobic nationalism. In fact, the scrolls represent exactly what we would expect from the opposition movement in this period, the movement that was opposed to um, Rome and any compromise so there were uh, with Rome. So there were zealots and guerrilla These are zealot texts of the most extreme kind. And what you're saying, basically, if I understand you right, is as the church moved to the west, it got more Hellenized. Well, and, that and was what the church was. The, the church was in uh, Rome. It was a Hellenized church. Yeah, at 356. When but it turns out yes. that we have a native Palestinian church. Yes. That's centering around an individual that most people have never heard about, who is in the Christian documents, who we think is reflected to a certain extent in the um, scrolls. And it's a uh, sensationalist, but it happens to be true. This is a a so-called brother of uh, Jesus, whatever that means, a person called James the Just. Now he, it turns out, was the head of this movement, whatever it was, in mm -hmm. Palestine. Normally his movement is called uh, the Jerusalem Community, mm -hmm. and his movement is this uncompromising, apocalyptic, uh, a militant movement based on the law and uh, based on, on not compromising with any foreign uh, control or any uh, foreign incursion into this. This mm -hmm. meshes exactly with the scrolls as we uh, have them. These are the theories we've been trying to develop and show, and this is why opening the monopoly gives us a better hearing so we get a fair debate in the mm -hmm. public so the public can inform themselves and make their own decision on this. Yeah. Also, in the scrolls you talk about concepts like the sons of light and against the sons of darkness. That's in the New Testament too, the sons yeah. of light. And the, seeing this world as a corridor to another place, uh, heaven. This was the first concept of heaven. That's what I've read that was written in there, that the first concept that was thought to be a Hellenized concept actually was given by the zealot. Actually, what they meant by it was, this couldn't be the real world. This must be a corridor to a better place to come. It could be. I, I don't see that in the scrolls, yeah. frankly. And we'd have to look at the passages yeah. that you're referring to. What I mean in the scrolls that I find is this mm -hmm. a much more down-to-earth, basic uh, messianism. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a concept that you have in the scrolls that will astonish your uh, viewers, I think. These people, and we have it in the scrolls, mm -hmm. both the previously published text and the new ones that we just published in this book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, which you showed at the mm -hmm. beginning of this um, program. We have the... We Excuse have, me, we didn't, so oh, we, we, didn't be show? we better show <laughs> it. This is, this uh, is this a penguin book. This book of the 50 best plates or uh, documents we think from the previously unpublished corpus that's just come out from Penguin Books. 
by Professor and, Weiss and myself. Yeah, and Dr. Eisenman is the first one to put us on the cutting edge ourselves yes, and well, judge for ourselves. Right, that's what, uh, that's what we have. Uh, that's what, that's what, what we want. We want people to become informed, get into the materials themselves, weigh the different theories, and decide who is uh, giving them a straight approach to these materials. Well, let me go back to what's in this. Yes. Uh, we have, uh, which most people don't even realize, this group, uh, thought of themselves as living out in the wilderness. That's the way in the wilderness mm -hmm. in the Gospels. Jesus mm -hmm. follows John mm -hmm. the Baptist in the way in the wilderness. This group uses the same quotations from Scripture, make a way in the wilderness, but applies it to themselves. They think or they uh, see themselves or present themselves as living in desert camps. Desert camps preparing, and what they're doing is preparing for a final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth. This is outlined in a doctrine from the published materials in a document from the published materials called the War Scroll. So these people are waiting in these desert camps, practicing a regime of extreme purity, all the biblical injunctions from the law in the most extreme way. And the reason is because they have the idea that the Messiah, it's crazy, but mm -hmm. it's there, led, leading the heavenly host will mm -hmm. come on the clouds. Mm -hmm. The heavenly hosts are a heavenly army. The heavenly hosts are their secret, secret weapon that they're going to not only destroy the Roman armies that are in Palestine, but all the opposing evil armies on the mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. And the only way that they can bring this heavenly host into play in the real world is through this perfect purity that the yeah. heavenly host will join them in their camps. We actually have texts saying the heavenly host are with us in, the, in our camps. The heavenly, uh, the heavenly angels are mm -hmm. with our footmen. So these people are preparing or believe that at the very moment they are there that the Messiah and the heavenly host are in their camps and are going to be with them in this final apocalyptic war against all evil. Uh, Dr. Eisenman, are they talking w about one Messiah or plural Messiah and is that Messiah the Son of God or he just a man? Uh, th the original the early text which is one of the uh, uh, dissimulation, the disinformation that was developed in the first 30 years, uh, the early texts that were released made it look as if we were talking about dual messiahs. They have a concept of dual messiah. So does Judaism in the um, Talmud, the Messiah ben David and the Messiah ben Joseph. But uh, it seems that also this idea was a messiah, a single messiah composed of both strands, a priestly and a, a lay messiah, exactly like you have in the letter to the Hebrews in mm -hmm. the Christian scripture. So the messiah we're getting about is, uh, we're getting in the new text is a real apocalyptic single son of David. Mm -hmm. uh, one last point that I forgot to mention about these camps, which is bizarre. Yeah. They felt that the heavenly angels, in order to come down on earth and fight with them, could not abide human pollution of any kind. So if there was any pollution in the camp, menstrual flows, <laughs> uh, sexual <laughs> fouls, anything like that, the, uh, the heavenly host wouldn't come. That's why they had to have extreme purity. Now, the Christian people, uh, scholars who were interpreting this, thought we were dealing with a kind of otherworldly asceticism. We're not dealing with an otherworldly asceticism. We're dealing with extreme purity regulations. And since the heavenly hosts have got to go back up to heaven again mm -hmm. in, the, in their ideology, there couldn't be any pollution in their camp. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the heavenly hosts wouldn't fight with them and wouldn't be able to go back to heaven. Of course. We <laughs> could use less pollution right here in Los well, Angeles. We and with some pure thoughts, we have to go to this brief timeout with Kaleidoscope. We'll be right with you. Stay with us.